Hello everyone. It is 6.17 a.m. Eastern Standard on August 23rd, 2019, but your guess is as good as mine. Today I am going to do my best to try to explain why I use Obri the way that I do, why I pronounce certain words the way I do, and why I am seeing concepts in Obri that nobody that I have read or heard, especially heard, because by today in the audio age, um, it seems that no one is challenging the form or origins of Hebrew. And when I say Hebrew, it should be synonymous in everybody's minds with Jewish rabbis, the Masoretes. I used to have to always call it Masoretic Hebrew, but that's what Hebrew is. Hebrew, even the pronunciation of it, which it should be Ober or Obri, Hebrew is another fiat, nonsensical, rabbinical creation. So I hope I will be able to convey some of the whys and uh, perhaps help more people who have some interest in what I'm doing linguistically or why I'm doing it. Because let's be honest, I'm not a linguist. I never set out to be a linguist. I don't claim to be a linguist or a philologist. Uh, I don't claim to be an expert on assumed ancient Near East studies. I'm just a guy. I'm just a guy who, uh, when it comes to the study of the Bible, have set my mind and heart on complete transparency and honesty in everything that I find. Those are my qualifications. I also have um, an unwavering trust and faith in the Aliyim, the God of the Bible. Um, <clears throat> so let me say before I begin that, because it's been a little while since I did a video and the last videos I did were in a sense a bit off topic with a number of the things that I usually discuss just because I found those pamphlets of Spooner so interesting. I didn't agree with all of his preconceptions. I didn't agree with all of his conclusions. However, I found his logic extremely interesting when it comes to the Constitution, specifically because of the perception that I have about it and how it was created and by whom and what their end game was and we're seeing it fulfilled today the end game it has been for a very long time couple of centuries so that's the reason um, and I do have a, a kind of a penchant for understanding the way that the sophists and casuists use these man-made laws to twist things and um, imprison people's minds and their bodies oftentimes. So um, what's happened in the last couple months 
is I have been, essentially, I am post-chemo. And one thing I wasn't explained pre-chemo is that post-chemo was actually, for most people, a rough time. Um, many people are advised that um, they're not even going to feel 100% for a year. Sometimes I have heard from some that it is over a year from when they had chemo and they still don't feel right in various ways. When I get tired, I get tired with a tiredness that is so palpable, so complete in my body and mind that if I don't get rest, it will have serious repercussions, especially on my mind. Because the chemo affects, again, your, your mind, the, the physical part of you that is responsible for certain operations. Um, it can, one thing it causes is anxiety. So, let's say that I am doing a lot of referencing in the morning for say, for instance, I am not only continually researching Mormonism because that, that turned into a rabbit hole that was so deep and so full of conflicting stories and cover-ups and deceptions. And let's be honest, folks, when Wikipedia uh, never has a bad word to say about an organization or religion. That should be a red flag, too. But it's going to take far more than just, you know, certain rudimentary glances at it. Um, sharp people out there today, like, you know, Matthew North, can put together a lot of connections between the Mormons and the alphabet agencies and the Jews and Jewish organizations through uh, some, some good, uh, vigorous searching. Uh, however, its inceptions, and because of how far back it goes, it requires far more in-depth reading and reading between the lines of a lot of those things you're reading. So that's something that is going to take far longer and will probably need to be produced as a number of other things that I do that have a certain level of complexity to them would have to be produced in written form and then, you know, presented in uh, either in audio format directly from written form or just uh, commented on and talked about uh, from the written form that I've already completed. In the same way, I am currently working on chapters of a complete book which will cover all of the problems with Palestine and the Levant geographically, with comparing them to what descriptions we see of the promised land and surrounding areas from the Bible. And believe me, the discrepancies are so vast that uh, a studious fellow could write a book on it. Why nobody has done it, who knows? Maybe there, um, many of them are just under the spell of the ancient Near East dogma. Um, maybe it's because a lot of these uh, men who we give far too much uh, respect to are asleep at the wheel and they don't have enough passion and pay enough attention to the scriptures to, and, and maybe not enough, who knows, uh, maybe not enough honesty when they do see all of the problems to say it. Um, but I've determined myself some time ago that whatever it is that I find, whatever problems that I find, I'm going to say it. So when I'm working on things like that, it does take up a lot of my time, a lot of my energy. And, and, and when you're doing research, like the research into those two areas that I'm doing, including 
the linguistic exercises that I, I do very, very, very frequently in between all of this, it what it does is it tends to, I hate to use the word trigger, but it does seem to sort of trigger um, anxiety. Like the, um, because your mind can get tired quickly too, you know. Uh, so it can trigger physical uh, symptoms of anxiety or panic. Uh, it's really easy to trigger anxiety and panic. Um, so sometimes w during that window that I usually have in the day to make videos, um, I'm usually either having to rest uh, because I've, I'm, I'm burnt out or um, because I'm trying to keep myself as active as possible today. Um, and I would say I'm very, very active for somebody just a couple months post chemo, which I'm really grateful for. I am um, just in the planning stages of putting the, the, the few different uh, areas that I cover into a, a podcast-like format, an, an audio driven format in, instead of video because, and that doesn't mean I'm not going to make any more videos, but I would, I'm thinking of mainly audio. Uh, because first off, I, I can to, to a degree describe, you know, most of, of what I'm, I'm trying to relate to you. And so a video is not necessary a great deal of the time. When it is, I can always make videos. But as I said uh, a long time ago, I, I don't want to continue my relationship with YouTube uh, because of the way that they behave. Um, right now, there aren't too many formats that can offer, first off, as, as fast d downloads for people. Even BitChute, which is pretty much where most of my videos are, are uploaded um, besides for YouTube. The problem with uh, BitChute or blockchain is that if you're looking at any kind of video that is over an hour, <clears throat> unless you're on a computer that has a very strong connection, you're, the loading time, the loading time <clears throat> could end up being so excessive that um, you know, some people just kind of g give up. Uh, however, there are a lot of people that have had to move to only blockchain formats because YouTube doesn't believe in free speech. They, they believe in this nonsensical fantasy called hate speech that that actually is a real thing. They don't really believe that, but they want you to believe that they believe that so that they can, as their kind has, for a very long time, centuries, silenced everyone telling the truth about them and their kind and their cohorts. So, anyways, on with this. I have a couple of examples on the screen that I'm going to talk about. You can look at the screen. It's not going to hurt, certainly. Um, and I also have a few other documents up, and hopefully when I put them all together and walk you through this, you'll at least understand my logic to why I perceive the language in the way I do, and certainly why I pronounce the language in the way I do. I posted a document quite some time ago at uh, obreproject.info. Um, it was a pronunciation chart for Obri because in the papers that I have thus far produced, because, because virtually every English translation is so poor and most of them entirely change certain proper 
nouns. Um, certain words that I present in a paper, ones that are important to the heart of the matter in the paper, I present in Obri. If one should take just a little bit of time to look at the Obri alphabet, as it were, the collection of glyphs that comprise that language, you'll be surprised at, first off, how similar it is to the Germanic languages that we speak. And if you speak English, and you would have to if you were listening to this right now, um, English is a very Germanic language. The modern German alphabet is virtually the same as English. Of course, the pronunciations are different and, in my opinion, far more appropriate and far closer to Obri. Uh, plus, for instance, uh, German has the um, a, a few extra letters, uh, the etzet, and um, uh, types a uh, ty a few types of diphthongs quite similar, um, which are the the dots over certain vowels that change the 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 sound of the vowel a bit. In my opinion, it's usually overemphasizing a a roundness of the palate when those letters are said. So besides for those variations, and if you go back in German, um, the let's just say the narrative anyways, we'll say that there was a high German and low German um, that was eventually standardized and so on and so forth. So today the English was based on German they would say 26-27% of English is German-based, including the alphabet, of course, heavily, and <clears throat> many of the words. The problem is how many other languages were blended in. French, Italian, Spanish, Latin, Greek. When you look at words in German, you'll notice that so many of them make far more sense because of how clear they are and consistent within a singular language as opposed to English. English is sort of the, um, the dream language of sophists and casuists. Uh, I don't think there was any accident about English and because I have a tendency to lean towards the theory that it was standardized uh, by a combination of the King James Bible and the figure called Shakespeare, which I think was really just the Baconians. And you can see Bacon all over the editorial style of the final translation of the King James Bible. There's no other good reason for why, um, if they used the Masoretic text, why so many uh, phrases are used, types of phrasing is used. So I'm going to show you and compare uh, modern English, which of course has virtually the same alphabet as modern German. And I'm going to compare that to Obri, not Hebrew. Yes, Hebrew has the same alphabet in the same order. However, they the, the deception starts even in the naming <coughs> of the letters. See, Hebrew has letters. Obri has glyphs. These are glyphs. These are, uh, as I call them, elemental ideographs. They're idea pictures. Um, and some of the writing I've done so far on just their notes on philosophy of language concerning Obrey. 
I hope will help you understand why these are glyphs, why these are ideographs, idea graphs, not idiot, ideographs, or ideograms, glyphs, rather than, as we think of it today, letters, letters that have, letters have no intrinsic value. The letters used in modern Western languages have no intrinsic value. However, if you study a dictionary, go from letter to letter, and look at the types of words that, say, just start with a certain letter, you'll be surprised at how many of those words actually have quite similar, especially the ones that are similar in form. They have quite similar feels, connotations. To them. So there still is a residue of this older language that our ancestors once spoke, even in today's English. So let's go through the alphabet for starters. So since most of you, all of you, should be familiar with English, I don't have to go through it, the English alphabet letter by letter. What I've done is I have highlighted in red nearly um, all of the letters that have a redundancy to them. Uh, now I didn't highlight X or Q and I'm going to point out Y. So what that leaves us with in the English alphabet after you get rid of the redundance are so-called A B, D, E, G, H, I, K, L, M, N, O, P, Q, R, S, T, U, X, and Z. Now, I highlighted C because it's redundant. C only mimics the sound of either K or S. F is a redundancy. F is uh, a letter that developed um, after the use of P and PH for an F sound. Uh, the J is an invention and redundancy. There is, there is no J used before a few hundred years ago. V and W are redundancies of U. Or sometimes, depending if, if you're looking at the way that Jews will translate words, and sometimes English translations based on, on Masoretic fiat pronunciations from B. They'll often even call the second letter of the Hebrew alphabet vet instead of bet. Okay? Now, <clears throat> The Obery alphabet. I'm not going to call them by their Jew names. I'm going to call them as they should be called, by the sound they make. So you have, in order, A, B, G, D, E, U, Z, H, T, I, K, L, M, N, O, S, P, Q, Tse, Er, Sh, Te. It's 22 glyphs. Now, except for two that are combined sounds and the Tse, which the Masoretes, or just Jewish rabbis, have deemed tzadi, which is also sort of a combination sound. Um, these all have direct uh, equivalents in English. Ah uh, has a. B has B. Now, if for anybody who knows modern German, you'll know that this is precisely the way 
that the the German alphabet is pronounced. Okay, um, ge has g, uh, de has d, e, e, um, and it, depending on who you talk to in modern German, sometimes they'll tell you that the e uh, is pronounced e, e or e. Um, and you'll kind of see the origins of soft versus, or long versus short sounds in English. Um, and there's a reason I put both capital and lowercase in English, because that is kind of a farce as well. Uh, so, U has U, Z has Z, Ha has H, Th. Now, that's one of those combination sound letters. Uh, the being very similar to the Greek theta. All right, E has I or Y, and that's, <laughs> do that. I was already thinking of these um, combination letters which is why I didn't include that. That has to go in with a red because it's a redundant. Okay, so continuing, K has K, L has L, M, M, N, N. Those are pretty obvious. O, O. And then you have S to S, P to P, Q to Q, then Ts is one of those that doesn't have a direct equivalent, although I did leave X in because X may not be a direct equivalent of the so-called Tsari or just Tsa. However, they are oftentimes translated into or from other languages in similar ways. For instance, X is oftentimes presented with a Z sound unless it's at the end of the word, a Z or S sound. You'll find that when you look at either Greek translations or English translations of the Old Testament, that the Tsa is often translated with an S sound or a Z sound. Uh, then air has R. Now, sh is another one of those combination sounds. And then t has T. They're all very similar. And they look very similar. The ones that are not going to look uh, very similar are going to be the th, which is like a circle with an X inside of it. The sh, which actually looks very much like a W, um, and tsadi, or tse, actually looks a lot like an X, strangely enough. Now, <coughs> some might say that the S in Obri doesn't look a lot like the S in English. However, if you pay attention to the fact that there are these these lines up here, and if you look at the progression of S uh, throughout <sighs> epochs of language, one place you can find this is in Encyclopedia Judaica or the Jewish Encyclopedia. Uh, surprisingly, they print the uh, evolution of these glyphs up to Hebrew, the Hebrew of today. Um, and that's all part of the deception to make it seem like the Jews are Israel and that they have been the sort of guardians of the language and scripture when they are nothing of the sort. But... Um, S having these, the uh, S and Obri having these three lines with a line through it. Um, if you should just connect these, these three lines, um, you'll see 
that it has a similar form. S has a top, a middle, and a lower line. Um, the middle line has just become diagonal over the years. So there is a similarity between the two. The rest of the letters, um, the similarity to them is far more obvious. Now the alphabet that I use that, that I created after looking at the oldest examples of um, so-called Hebrew that I could find, it is very, very similar to the older forms, except not exactly the same. Um, these glyphs don't always point in exactly the same direction as they did um, in certain examples of older documents, or even a lot of the things I saw were on stones, uh, stone slabs, stella. Um, and I know that as time goes on, I may change my mind about their orientation. The reason I oriented them in the way I do and the reason why there's going to be at least one more um, development in the alphabet. And it's going to be very, very, very similar to, to this, which I just call uh, Obri Beta 3, um, is because for some letters, I'm going to make them a bit more easy for anyone to write them out by hand. That's one of the reasons that they have the orientation they currently have, is so that they are easier to write by hand, and so that the person who speaks English or uh, any language that is similar to or derived from what's called Germanic will be very comfortable with this language. So that should help explain a bit um, about just how absolutely similar Obery is to English. You have only a few spots in which you have a different pattern than the English letter pattern as far as how they appear, and only a couple uh, glyphs that are very different than letters we have in English. They're just combination sounds. The th, the ts, the sh, and a bit with the qua, because even though uh, Hebrew will never present the, uh, what they call kof, in a qua kind of sound, um, it is very much the reason I believe we have to uh, find so many Q words where the Q is not at the end but at the beginning uh, or in the middle presented with a U after because if it didn't have that it would just be redundant with the K which you'll find that phonetically it usually is if you don't include that U. And as I said, there are very few examples in our modern Western languages where you won't find it paired with the U. That's why I would pronounce it as qua instead of like the K, which is ka, qua, ka. Um, so if you look at that document at obri.info, um, you'll see all the glyphs and their pronunciations. I would have to tell you right now that I believe that those pronunciations that I have presented in that document, I don't believe that they are going to change much, if at all, as I learn more. So a couple of big things is the names I use, common names. So there is the name of 
Aliyim or God, and there is the name of Israel's Redeemer that we see in English as Jesus. Uh, and unfortunately, we see in, well, we see it in Greek as Jesus, and then in Hebrew as Yeshua. Um, in the case of the name of Aliyim, I, I pronounce it Yehweh. 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 In the case of Israel's Redeemer, my Redeemer, I pronounce it Yusho. So that is a marked difference between the acceptable pronunciations by those who are trying to use their actual names. And I can completely appreciate those who wish to call them by their actual name. I would far prefer being called John or Jonathan than Juan or even Johan or any of the other um, variations of John. You know, I don't want to be called Giuseppe uh, in any different language. Languages that are similar to Germanic and English, I would prefer to be called John. Even understanding that J was a contrivance or invention. Uh, in fact, I would be fine with being called the Obery, uh version of Jonathan uh, Unitun. But other than that, um, yeah, Juan just doesn't do it for me. So I can understand those who want to use the actual name and pronunciation of the Father, the actual name and pronunciation of the Savior and His Son. And I'm going to explain to you why I use the pronunciation I do and how that works exactly in Obery world. Okay, so I have written down probably not even all the English variations of the name of Alium. Actually, I, which one did I forget? Uh, well... Let's just go with these. So, you have your uh, King James Standard, Jehovah. You know, like the Jehovah Witnesses will tell you that they are the only ones who uh, bear the torch of pronouncing the name of God. So, you have Jehovah. And then, um, you have your more sophisticated uh, Hebrew version, Yahweh. Uh, then you have the folks who go the Yahuwah route. Um, and to be honest, if you're going to work um, in the area of Hebrew, uh, Yahuwah would actually probably be a bit more correct than Yahweh. But there's a reason for Yahweh. Now you have, uh, you have your certain Jews out there who uh, will pronounce it Yehovah, and then you have the people out there who are so confused about how it should be pronounced um, because of the confusion purposely applied to this language that they will literally just pronounce it as the <laughs> Jewish Masoretic names of the letters, yud hey vav hey. Uh, I reject all of these. As most of you will know, when I say the name of our Aliyim, our Father, I say Yehweh. So, let me just write it here. All right, and it started coming up in English. 
you'll see in English a, a, a Y, an E, a U, and an E. Because, um, I, and I also have on the screen the Hebrew uh, version of it. And what you'll see is a Yot, since they write backwards, and that's the other uh, deception to it. I don't write Obri backwards. I write it flowing to the right hand, which is very much a biblical principle, to flow to the right hand, which the sheep are on, not, to, not flowing to the left hand that the goats are on. I write it the way that we modern descendants of Israel still hold our language today to the right hand. So, showing it in the Jewish way to the left hand, you have the so-called Yod, the so-called He, the so-called Vav, or some will say Wa, because of course they don't agree on anything either, uh, unless it's ta unless the subject is fleecing the goyim, and then the so-called he. But when you understand how similar a language obri is to our modern Germanic and English, it's very easy. Let me just copy paste this real quick. and transpose it into Obri Beta 3. And here you have Yi, which would be the equivalent to what we call I. You could really, I, I could have actually scratched the I and made the Y um, the letter used in, in English. Okay? Either way. Because this E and that's what I will pronounce it in Obri, is E. Be, and here's why. Because its usage within words is more like Y than I. It's just that the Y was out of place with it, so I left the I. Um, it has a usage in Obri that is very much like Y. So yellow, you'll see it in Aliyim. And you'll see it in simple words like yam, uh, which is used for both sea or west. Um, simple words like yad, which is used for hand or paw, the end of a limb. Um, so, e, e, u, e. And if you just use some common sense, to the way that vowels flow in Germanic kindred languages. You get ie ue, ie ue. And it's just that simple. So I hope that explains why I don't pronounce it Yahweh. For one thing, let's use Let's just use some consistency. Besides for the contrived Masoretic Nikudot, which you'll see in applied here to the name of our Aliyim, which is a fiat system of pronunciation, and it is completely inconsistent. If I showed you similar words to Yahweh, because Iye Uwe is just made up of a prefix, which, now this, I'm going to tell you something that goes completely against what all the Jews teach as Masoretic Hebrew, that this so called Yad is used as a prefix. Uh, meaning like he, and it, it doesn't work that way because it would be utterly redundant in grammatical context to apply it in that way. However, if you understand that 
the words of Aubrey, um, most of them, unless you're talking about um, words that are used for types of punctuation, like there's no question mark, there's no punctuation, there's no question mark, there's no period, there's no exclamation point, comma, in Aubrey, but instead you might see the word meh, which is going to uh, indicate that there is a question after that, okay? Besides for words like that, which are sort of punctuation words or uh, types of uh, emotive words even, most of the words that we would call nouns, vowels, and even adjectives and adverbs are what I call complete words. They are words wherein they are what they do, they describe. But to know what form they're being used in, you look at their context and what prefixes, suffixes, or affixes, and affixes are glyphs that are inserted somewhere in the midst of a word instead of at the front or back, uh, it's going to tell you what form a word would take. So if you see something in Aubrey, if you see a, a phrase where it say, let's say it says, we amar yewe, uh, the, the u is working as a hook or an addition, so it will signal a, a new phrase, or it can also signal an add-on to a phrase. You can know that simply by the context of the grammar. And the E after it will signal whether that complete word, and as I said, most of them are, is going to be used as a action or an object. The action is going to have that arm or limb there. So we have this action prefix with the e u e. Now if you see e i e, it will be usually was. You'll see it first in Genesis chapter 1. Um, uh, like the evening and the morning were the first day you would have aya. Um, when you change the vowel glyph in many words from e to u or vice versa, um, you can change the tense of something. Here, let me give you better examples. Uh, H 1961. Instead of in uh, Genesis 1, where it says evening and morning were the first day, that is ye -e instead of e -e -e. Um You'll find the e -e -e, so it's the E-Y-E, -e, um, to not confuse. You'll find that in, say, Genesis 1-2. The earth was uh, without form. Um, and then you'll find another form of it in Genesis 129. Uh, let fruit uh, be for food. You'll find that uh, in that verse as well. Uh, also in Genesis 2.18, where we see in English that uh, Yahweh Aliyim said it was not good for man to be alone. And you'll find this form here, um, Ayut, and that T at the end uh, before e Adam the Adam of um, be of the Adam. Oftentimes, when you have a e an e at the end, transitioning to words in front of it, it is replaced by the T. I've found this to be the same, and of course, there are no Masoretic rules. Um, that have any consistency or satisfy concerning the T or T at the front of the word instead of E. Um, the E oftentimes, what they'll tell you is that it's a rule for uh, a proper noun and that does work oftentimes. 
Um, sometimes you'll see it, uh, the T replaced when it's a, a feminine proper, but is not always the case. However, so here's the form, a form of it. It takes various forms depending on the context and what comes before it and after it. So for man to be alone, um, you apply that to the name of Alien. And what you get is the Obery original to what then later would become the Greek translation, Ego uh, for instance, that you would see the I am, um, which in English would become I am when, for instance, when Masha, Moses, asks Yahweh who should he say sent him and then you see in English tell them I am sent you um, they're indicating essentially the root meaning of Yahweh it is a word that in its various forms <clears throat> we would usually see in English translated as B. Um, you could see it as am or exist. Um, and then some people would say that the E, at them talking about letter and sound, which is often called Yad at the front, would mean ant or I. And then the E, U, E be or am either which way you see that that's the makeup of the word uh, it is his name that he's given to us to use when referring to him not just a title but a name and what is his name it's it's like I've been looking at well not looking at but finding that all these obery words are they are complete words they are as they do and that can also be used descriptively that's why i just call them complete words because they're not necessarily noun or verb or adjective or adverb they are very much complete words and this is why when I, and I probably won't have time this video, but when I begin to talk about the, the philosophy of language concerning Obery, you'll see that the one language that I've found in all the languages that I have perused through to find the closest, um, not equivalent, but language that can describe everything about the characteristics of Obery I've found so far, the closest thing I've come across so far is ASL, American Sign Language, <clears throat> or a few other forms of sign language. Because in ASL, ASL does not get itself all wrapped up in um, all of the extras that are applied to English, the form of English, the grammar used in spoken English. It doesn't get itself wrapped up in that. And the signs that it uses actually um, are far more similar. Let me go back to the Obrey document. Far more similar to these elemental ideographs um, than anything that you're going to find in necessarily a written or spoken language today um, because the orientals so the far easterners whatever they like to be called the languages over there korean chinese uh, japanese <coughs> and any other language of any of those other peoples that reflect those characters 
because they have not been changed as this language has been over the years, it still retains its quality of being ideograms or ideographs. Um, so anyways, before I, I descend too far into explaining the substance of the glyphs and words, there you have the reason I do not pronounce Yahweh. As I said, it doesn't even follow any kind of consistent pattern. If this was Yod, He, Vav, and He, you should at least expect it to be an E, E, Ye, U, or V. If it had to be V, you would expect Ye, V, Ye, V, the same sound. There isn't even a secondary so-called uh, vowel over here to affect this final so-called vowel or he to make it that sound that they say or the first vowel to make it the sound that they say ah there's not even a consistency to the hebrew yahweh it's all in their dots and dashes their nikudo their fiat language that i don't use <clears throat> so moving on from that there is yeshua i do not pronounce the redeemer's name yeshua i pronounce it yusho and i'm going to show you why now what i could just start with is the old testament yusho joshua and now as you see it <laughs> there their sophistry and their manipulation is already in full swing if you should bring up the entry for it h3091 in strong's as the blue letter bible has it they're already adding an extra oo after the sh which is not there in the text so i can go to a few places here I can just go to the first entry which is Exodus 17 9 and I'm gonna do it in the Q Bible since I have something else already brought up in the okay in uh, Esword so Exodus 17 9 I will bring that up real quick and I will just show you in the text <laughs> his name all right it, it doesn't have that oo in there okay it's just e e u sh o you show um you, the only other variation you're going to see i will show you here actually so besides a possible minority spelling you might find in which you might see an oo sound after the sh you're going to always find it as yeah, show. Now, in Numbers thirteen sixteen, it explains that Masha Moses called the Joshua we know of that the book of Joshua was named after. That he called, and it's going to give his name as the same spelling except without the e or y at the front just an e u sh o you show e u having the same kind of <coughs> diphthongish sound as europe you show or e u show there's just a bit more of a emphasis on the e in e u show moses called you show e u show okay um it could be that he called him that to specify um, because of the root of his name, which we'll look at, the saving, the Usho part there. Um, he could have named him that because of the fact that he became 
Masha's right hand man. Um, and he was true in everything that he did um, as Masha knew him. So that could be why he called him a you show instead of just the, the simple you show. Now, that name there, if you, if you kind of break it down and look at it, the e eh at the front uh, could be the, and then you have this Usho here, and if we go to that being H3467, I have the instances of that up. There's over 200 occurrences, and it's virtually always going to be translated as saves, saved, uh, and you'll have it in different forms. Um, it translates very well as saves. Um, and in fact, when you look at the first form of his word, e eh and usho, um, the salvation or the savior, a usho. Um, the interesting thing is that is the very name of the prophet who penned the book called Hosea. And if you consider the subject matter in the book of Hosea, it is the most, probably the most succinct metaphor in the Old Testament to what Aliyim Yahweh would do with his only born of a woman son. He's not his only son, because <clears throat> you'll remember in the book of so-called Hosea, and it is echoed much in the New Testament <clears throat> that because of him, because of his redemption and how he has changed our hearts, those who have been redeemed, uh, we would be called Beni Aleim, the sons of the living God. But he's the only son of his born through woman, Yusho. Um, so it's, it's very, it's not ironic, it's very deliberate that the book of the prophet Hosea is this original name of Joshua, Yusho, uh, Masha calling him with the more heavily accented E on the front, Yusho. Um, so as I showed you here, you have the word that is most commonly translated as save, saved, salvation. And again, that's going to be whether you have um, this E on the front making it an action or you don't making it a thing. You'll always find it as Usho. Now, what do the Masoretes do. They say it's pronounced Yasha because of their little dots and dashes. Yasha. Okay. This symbol right here, if you go far enough back, it is just represented as an O, like our O today. And you'll find a number of Hebrew words in which the Masoretes, of course, allow it to be pronounced as it should <coughs> an O. Unless it's at the front of a word, then they'll oftentimes put a G sound on it, like the city called Gomorrah. It's actually Omre. Omre. Uh, so there is your root to the name Yusho, not Yeshua. It's this Yisho saves. Now, the name of our father, Yahweh, his name is <clears throat> truncated throughout all kinds of names that you'll see given to Israelites throughout the Bible. You'll see it in um, a lot of names that you'll see that start with a J. Um, Jehu, uh, Joash, uh, Josiah, 
those names are commonly st starting with an e e, which is the truncated Yahweh. So if you put that on the front of the saves e e, and then you change the e, it's not e, it's u, and I can show you right here. It, it's because it's because they misrepresent in the strong concordance uh, it's just by default the strong's concordance is so so misrepresentative of the language it's just sickening if you look at it in the text itself you're going to see it most commonly in its action form as u u show u show you have it here with the n i will u show no u show okay it's u show so you put that e a the truncated Yahweh, on to saves, usho, you have Yusho, Yusho. Now, I know his name is the same because we'll put in Strong's G2424, which you're going to see in the Greek as Isus. Now, I don't particularly care for a lot of Greek transliterations. However, it does illustrate something very interesting. Now, the final sigma is a really common suffix whenever names or proper or specific nouns are transliterated into koine. And koine is its whole, it's a whole other can of worms in and of itself. However, you will see it as a pattern this final sigma. If you just take away this final sigma and you will see the um, you'll see the iota and the oh I don't oh, for crying out loud I hate how they've they've changed the H to an E sound. I iota eta sigma Omicron Upsilon. It took me a while to remember the actual names of Greek. I could actually read and pronounce Greek before I could remember the names of Greek. Oh, and that's one thing I forgot to bring up in the German alphabet is the Y is pronounced the same as the Greek uh, Y, Ypsilon or Upsilon. Because you see that the upsilon, when you see it in its uh, capitus, is looks like the Y. Uh, that's one interesting link between Greek and Germanic. Um, so block that last sigma there. Since I don't know exactly why that is stuck on so many transliterated names at this point in time. But <clears throat> you will see the basics of the vowels. Um, the E, E, the S, the sigma for SH, because they didn't have a SH sound in Greek. And U sound at the end, because it's transliterated. So where you would have had in the Obri, you show, you have in the Greek, E, E, S, U, S. Isis. That's why it's transliterated in that way. Now, besides for the many references to um, Jesus, the Savior, Redeemer, which is a lot of them, if you go up to, let me get my books straight here real quick. So you go up to the book of Hebrews, or <laughs> Obrim, Hebrews. Um, you'll see just in Hebrews 2.9, but we see Jesus. They're talking about the Jesus of the Gospels, our Redeemer, Savior. But we see Jesus, who is made a little lower than the angels. Fast forward a little bit to Hebrews 4, 8. For if Jesus had given them rest, 
then would he not afterward have spoken of another day? Later on, they changed that and started using Joshua in Hebrews 4.8. It is the same name, Joshua. Okay? If, if they were being consistent uh, throughout the Gospels in English, our Savior's name would just have been Joshua. It is the same name. Now, the, mon the one monkey wrench that Strong's will give you is if you look at all the various definitions in G2424 of Jesus, definition D, they'll say Jesus, son of Eliezer, one of the ancestors of Christ, as per Luke 3.29. Uh, you go to Luke 3.29, which was the son of Josie, they say. In here, uh, the word popping up is actually uh, Iota Omega Sigma Eta. Um, Iose. Iose. If it's, a, <coughs> excuse me, if it's a related name, it actually has the same vowel and consonant structure as, for instance, you show. If I were to pop on the Byzantine Greek New Testament, it still registers as Iose, not um, Isus, which is the same form that Joshua, the su successor of Moses, takes in Hebrews 4, which is exactly the same form that our Redeemer, our Savior and King's name takes. Thus, it being the equivalent of both the prophet so-called Hosea and the one who led Yisrael into the promised land, so-called Joshua, both of them their names in Obri being quite similar. And a quick enter, enter, e, e, u, you show. That's why I do not say Yeshua. If you look at Yeshua, uh, and some of the possible connotations of the roots of that word, it is a a more demeaning word than its proper form you show. So the Father is Yahweh, the Son and Redeemer is you show. And that's all I've got for today. Take it easy.